There was a moment when each of us chose to be UMC. We found a home in a local church, a place to share, pray, serve, learn, and grow. Our story joined with others and became part of a global connection. Together, we are making a difference. We see it in a congregation that is rebuilding their community after a natural disaster. We see it in the smiles of people who are searching for meaning and found it in the sanctuary of a United Methodist Church. We see it in a missionary dedicating her life to serving, supporting, and loving people others may forget. We see it in the millions of hearts that have been warmed in our Bible studies and vacation Bible schools. We see it in people tirelessly challenging the status quo and taking a stand for what's right. We see it in local churches who build trust and partnerships by nurturing faith, filling bellies, and providing care. Together, we are transforming the world. We are present in more than 100 countries, speaking many languages and representing diverse cultures. But our 43,000 local congregations all share a Wesleyan mission and ministry, a rich history, a dedication to service and outreach, and a passion for following Jesus through worship, prayer, and the study of Scripture. And together, more than 12 million members strong, we are the people of God called United Methodist. We are the church together. Let's continue to be UMC. Okay, a couple years ago, a few professors from Baylor University decided to poll people, to do a survey about how people view God. So they did the survey and they pulled their findings together. And what they found is that there were basically four ways that people viewed God. And the first one was that a lot of people saw God as an authoritative God. And what that meant is that they, God was very judgmental and very engaged in their lives. And there was actually a, a higher percentage of males in that category than females. The second um, view was of a um, benevolent God, who was a, a God who was very loving and involved in their lives, a God that offered a personal relationship, like a friendship. And that also had, was kind of skewed with more females having that perspective than the males in that group. The third group saw God as a critical God, and he was kind of removed from the daily lives, but he would, be in, he would have judgment in the afterlife. And then the final perspective was that God was a distant God. And that was that he had sort of set the universe in motion, and then he had kind of disengaged from us. So in the U.S., those were the four perspectives. And, and the professors of Baylor felt very much that One's belief about God impacted one's morals, behaviors, and politics. So today we're going to continue our sermon series on why I'm United Methodist. The point of that bumper is because a lot of times people don't even know who the Methodist church is. Many of you maybe don't realize we're a world church. We're a little different than the Lutherans or the Presbyterians. We're a little more Catholic in that way. We are across the globe. And so it's important that we know who we, who we are and what we believe. I remember when I was young, I had heard that a Methodist could believe whatever they want, and that is absolutely not true. We have a very de um, defined doctrine, which we're going to talk about today. We have a very clear vision of who we are. But we're going to continue this conversation because I don't know how all of you view God, but United Methodists have a definite perspective of who God is. And my guess is that all these perspectives I've just named probably are in this room or a combination of them because we were all raised in different households and in different ways and we've been impacted by different churches. And so today we're going we're gonna to kind of learn what is the United Methodist perspective on who God is. And um, we're going to do it through a really great passage in the um, New Testament. And um, 
it's about a man who's feeling kind of insecure about his faith. Like he doesn't feel sure. He feels a little insecure. And so he goes to Jesus to get some answers. And I'm reading to you out of John 3, verses 1 through 8. There was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a Jewish leader. He came to Jesus at night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for who... For no one could do these miraculous signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered you, I assure you, unless someone is born anew, it's not possible to see God's kingdom. And Nicodemus asked, how is that possible for an adult to be born? It's impossible to enter a mother's womb for a second time and be born, isn't it? And Jesus answered, I assure you. Unless someone is born of the water and the spirit, it's, it's not possible to enter God's kingdom. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of the spirit is spirit. Don't be surprised that I say to you, you must be born anew. God's spirit blows where it wishes. You hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it is going. It's the same with everyone who is born of the spirit. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right, so this is a, a great story about a, what we'll say, a man who has truly earned his righteousness. He is a Pharisee in the first century, and that meant he was a respected man. People looked at him and the way he lived his life. If you had to say who were the best people in the first century, you would say a Pharisee because they lived out the law of Moses and they did it really well. In fact, probably you were a Pharisee because you had that personality that could be disciplined, follow the rules, eat the right food, eat with only the right people. And Pharisees did. They even knew how to worship correctly. They weren't like the masses who were just kind of struggling through life. The Pharisees were the top of the top, and everybody respected them. But this, this man, Nicodemus, was a Pharisee, and he was not happy. He was insecure. He didn't feel secure in his faith and what he believed. And so it says he went at night. He probably didn't want anyone to know that he was going to go talk to Jesus. But he needed answers. He knew something was missing from his life. And so he goes to Jesus, and, and Jesus says the craziest thing. He says, you have to be born anew. In some translations, it says born again. And he's like, come on, you can't be born again? We all know that you can't enter your mom's womb a second time. What are you talking about? And Jesus says, you got it. You cannot do it. That is the key here. You see, Nicodemus was earning his way into heaven. He was earning a relationship with God by just doing everything perfectly. But Jesus said, all that stuff you're doing, you don't earn your way into a relationship with God. It is freely given. You're not capable of doing it. Only the Spirit can do, the Spirit of God. And, and the thing about the Spirit is, it blows wherever it wishes, because only God can save us. The wind you cannot control, it blows where it blows. And what he was trying to say to Nicodemus, you can do all the work you want, but you are saved by grace and grace alone. And thank goodness, you know, because people who are really disciplined, they have to work at it. It's a burden. They can't ever relax. He says, you are saved by grace. You aren't capable of doing it yourself. So that is really good news. And that's important for us to read today because we, the founder of the United Methodist Church was a man back in the 1700s named John Wesley. He was the founder of the Methodist movement, which later on expanded into a denomination. And he was an insecure man. He practiced his faith. He was raised in a, in, in a Christian home. He became educated and became an Anglican priest. Nobody worked harder than John Wesley to be holy, to do the right thing, to share the gospel. He worked so hard at it, but he, in his mind, was miserable because he was not successful. Last week, Gary talked about his unsuccessful mission, a missionary trip to the United States. He didn't feel satisfied with how he was living out his faith. And then something happened. Gary shared last week, he read out of one of John's journals. 
and the the date on the entry was oh where is it oh may 24th 1738 and this is what john talked about he went to a a service and somehow in that service god moved on him and he had he had a um a religious experience of the heart no longer was a faith that was all intellectual. It was of the heart. He was changed in a moment. And he knew it was God. And suddenly he saw all this hard work I've been doing. That is not why I'm saved. I'm saved because grace and grace alone is because God saved me out of his abundant love. And he loves me and all my imperfections. He loves me, loves me, loves me. And it's a free gift freely offered to me. I don't have to earn it. And this news changed his life. It was at that moment that the Methodist movement really truly began, was birthed in that night. Because John could not be held down. He, couldn't, he was so excited about what he experienced, this love for God. It was a, now his faith was a religion of the heart. And it was like wildfire. Faith, John preached and, and people were saved and changed and transformed over in England and then it came to the U.S. Have you ever noticed that there's like a Methodist church in every town and often on many different blocks in the same town? We're everywhere because it exploded here. It absolutely exploded. And that all started because a man had a heart experience. John had a saying that I think really sums the whole thing up for us. And I'm going to tell it to you. This is what John used to say. John said, grace for all and grace in all. Okay, I want you to think about that. Grace for all and grace in all. This defines us as United Methodists. Let me explain what it means. The first one, grace for all, was basically this understanding that God's grace was for every human being on earth. That, in that time in the 1700s, he really stirred up some trouble here because there was a lot of people who believed only in election, that only certain people were saved or called. And John was like, no, 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 God loves everybody. And he used this story to explain God's love. This is a story, a parable that Jesus taught about a man who had a, had a troublesome kid. A, maybe, a, um, um, I don't know what his deal was, but he came to his dad one day and he said, Dad, I want my inheritance, which was basically saying, I wish you were dead. Can I have it early? And, and his father just gave him the inheritance and he went out to sow his oats, to get out of his dad's house, to be the man he was going to be. And he was a miserable failure. He went out and he lost all of his money. And he um, eventually decided to return to his, parent, his dad's house, broken, broke. And really he came back to eat because he was hungry. And the story that Jesus tells is of the father who is waiting for the son. And he sees the son way off in the distance and he starts running towards his son. And his arms are wide open and he grabs his child, that wayward um, son that just had really hurt his feelings. And he wrapped his arms around him and he said, welcome home. And he, and he gave him a party to celebrate his return. And Jesus told that story to teach us that God feels that way about everybody. He wants everybody in. We're all his children. And that's a great story, but that, that got John in a little bit of trouble. But that's our belief as United Methodists, God's love for all people. The second part about grace and all which might be surprising to some of you today because you may not really understand this. Grace in all means this. At any point, all people are experiencing some level of grace. All the time. And I'm going to explain this to you because that's kind of crazy, but it's true. So this is, this is how it works. It's all grace, but John would break it into different terms so we'd understand how grace works in our lives. To help us really understand how spectacular it really is. It's all the same grace. But he started out with something called provenient grace. Let me read this. Provenient grace is the grace that comes to us before we know God. In provenient grace, God takes the initiative 
The Book of Discipline of the United Methodist Church defines this grace as the divine love that surrounds all humanity and precedes any and all of our conscious impulses. What this means is that God comes to us first. He pursues us. He chases after us. If you're not a believer, he's pursuing you. It's a given to all people. He's constantly pursuing you because he wants a relationship with you. If you have a relationship with him now, it's not because you were a good person. It's because God pursued you first. He wooed you into a relationship and you accepted it, but he came to you first. That's provenient grace. If you have any family members or people you love that are not Christians, I want you to know that God's provenient grace is at work in their life right now. God isn't going to give up on them. He is not going to give up on them. We have free will. We can decide. We can reject it. But he's not going to stop pursuing because he loves all people. There's a story that explains provenient grace. I've used it here before, but it's worth repeating again because it's a good Southern story. Provenient grace is like grits, okay? How is it like grits? Well, there was this man who was in the South, and he went to a restaurant to have breakfast. And he ordered his eggs, and he ordered his toast. And after a while, the food came, and they put it in front of him, and he had his eggs and his toast, and then there was this little bowl with white mush in it. And he looked at that, and he said to the waitress, Ah, uh, what's that? And she said, grits. He says, well, I didn't order grits. And she said, they just come. <laughs> That's what the Holy Spirit is. Whether you want the Holy Spirit to pursue you or not, it just comes. He pursues you because he loves you and he doesn't give up on you. That is provenient grace. The next grace, all part of the grace you know, all grace is the same, but the second one he defined as justifying grace. Let me read this. Through justifying grace, we find pardon for our sin. The book of discipline says of this, God reaches out to the repentant believer in justifying grace and accepting and pardoning love. This is salvation. This is being born anew or born again. This is what happens to us when we accept a relationship after that, grace pursues us. John Wesley used to say it was like walking through a door. You walk through a door, you were one this way, and then you were another way. And so I got a, a story to kind of help you what it, understand what it is. It's by Max Licato. It's a, a story about a messy man. This messy man lived on his own, and he was just a slob. He didn't ever make his bed. Um, he didn't ever put the top on the toothpaste. It was, why bother? You're going to brush your teeth again. Why make your bed? You're going to climb in it again. He just was a messy person. He was very comfortable being messy, and he embraced his messiness. But then he fell in love, and he got married, and she did not embrace his messiness. And so for her, he changed he started putting the toilet paper roll on the holder. He started picking his towel up after he took a shower. He started doing things for her because he loved her. But then one day she went on a trip and she was going to be gone seven days. And he thought, oh, this is where the rubber meets the road. And so he said, for six days, I will just be the way I am. On the seventh day, I'll clean up. But the weirdest thing happened all through the week, he just didn't feel comfortable in the messiness anymore. He didn't like climbing into a bed with all the covers in a pile. So he started making his bed. And he had actually kind of learned that when you pick up your towel and you hang it up, it's dry the next day. And, and he started finding out that he liked the neatness. And he was confused by this. But as Max Clayton will say, he was exposed to a higher standard of living. And that's what Jesus does through justifying grace. He changes us. And so that's, that's justifying grace. We are new people. We're made new. The power of sin in our lives has been broken. It doesn't mean we don't sin, but we have the power to overcome now. Plus, we have this a promise of eternal life. We have resurrection life on earth. There's all kinds of amazing things that we could go on and on about because of justifying grace. 
The third type of grace is sanctifying grace. Let me spell this. Read this. Excuse me. Sanctifying grace is a purifying and cleansing process that continues through our lives as disciples of Jesus Christ. Sanctifying grace is the bearing fruit part of God's grace. Through sanctification, according to the book of discipline, we are enabled to increase in knowledge of and love of God and in love for our neighbor. All right, so I'm going to explain to you what this is not first to make you help and to understand what sanctifying grace is. This is a, um, a quote from Nadia Boltz, Nadia Boltz Weber. Um, she's a, a Lutheran pastor that I really appreciate. She said this, How often are we just like the rhino on the treadmill, sweating and striving and overexerting ourselves, thinking that if we just ran a few more miles, we could become an entirely different creature than the one God made us? That's not sanctifying grace. He's not changing us into a different animal. He's not making us into different people. He's bringing out the very best that's already in us. There is, there is something beautiful in all of us, and he brings that out. Thank goodness. I know your family's all relieved, right? The goodness in us needs to come out. We're pretty good at holding it down sometimes. But that's what sanctifying grace does. The rest of your life, you are being sanctified. You're not being asked to change your personality. You can still be who God made you to be, but you are, he's bringing the good out of you. He's making into a better you. That's the power of sanctifying grace. And here's the deal, when we're a better us, we are much more effective in spreading the love of Jesus Christ to the world. We just are. There's a last grace, and I, I hesitate to tell you because I hate the name of it. Oh, I hate the name of it because it confuses and it muddies the waters. But I do want to mention it because it's important. The last grace is called Christian perfection. That's dreadful. Christian perfection goes against the whole concept of, 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 of grace that we're accepted as we are and we're, we're encouraged but perfection, I don't like that word. I think back in the 1700s, it had a different feel to it. But now it doesn't work. But let me read to you what Christian perfection is. It'll make more sense. Christian perfection is the name given to the process or the event of achieving spiritual maturity or perfection. We're just talking about maturity of faith. That's also offered through the grace of God. There is a, a scripture that backs this up in 1 Corinthians 13, 11 that says, when I was a child, I used to speak like a child, reason like a child, think like a child, but now I have become an adult. It says man here, but I'll say adult. I've put an end to childish things. <sighs> I heard a, well, Gary was telling me on the way over the drive this morning, he told me something that, what one of his professors taught him, then I'll tell you what one of my professors taught me, because I really struggled that that word perfection kind of messed me up. I just kept thinking. I had a few professors say that they had achieved Christian perfection. And when somebody tells you that, that's when you're kind of sure you don't believe it anymore because you know you know them. And so I it just I didn't like it, but then Gary said he had a professor that says, you know you are moving into Christian perfection when your knee reaction is holy. Think about that. How often is your knee reaction holy? I know mine isn't yet. I got a ways to go. But when your knee reaction is holy, this is the way another professor explained it to me. He said, my wife and I have been married some 50 years, and we do not have a perfect marriage at all. But I'm fully committed. I will be with her, and I will love her, and I will honor her, and I will care for her until the day I die. Because I am fully in and she is fully in. We are fully committed to each other. And we're not going anywhere. And that's what he said Christian maturity is like. When we are so fully in that no matter what rocks our world, and there's some tough stuff out there that will rock our worlds, it won't matter. We're committed. We're fully here. I'm a United Methodist because the grace that has been taught to me through this church makes me more in love with the God, with God every day. 
I no longer think in terms of a judgmental, critical God. I think of a God who pursues me and everybody else, not because we deserve it, but because he simply loves us. I am in love with our, with our understanding of who God is because God offers salvation through, through this justifying grace because he knew that we were a people that needed help, that we couldn't do it on our own. I love our understanding of who God is as a United Methodist because I, I understand that when I do get saved, God's not going to leave me the way I was. He's going to change me. He's going to make me a better version of who I am. I love our understanding of who God is because I can live with the assurance and peace that maturity brings even in a volatile world. I love being a United Methodist because it teaches me who God is and how much he loves me. And that just changes everything. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.